Most documentaries about prisoners of war tell of the extremes. Extreme hardships faced by POWs from many wars in many nations. And during World War II, there's no denying that many of the 130,000 American prisoners of war faced grim conditions, cruelty, and even death at the hands of their captors. Despite these undeniable facts, not all prisoner of war camps were unbearable. This is the story of POWs from Germany who were held in nearly every state in our nation, including Iowa. Prisoners of war in Iowa? Yes, by the thousands. Algona, Iowa, which then had a population of about 5,000, was a POW hub which could hold 3,000 POWs and was responsible for distributing 10,000 prisoners to more than 30 branch camps in Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Obscured by time and fading memories, this story has resurfaced in recent years, in part because of an organization called Traces, run by a man named oh, Michael Lewick Trams. Everyone has a conference packet, right? Michael, an author, lecturer, and historian, followed his Quaker roots to study the social impact of World War II. He has immersed himself in the study of relations between Iowans and Germans who have World War II connections, conducting personal interviews with former POWs in Germany. I think Iowans in general were very generous to the, to the Germans, um, very hospitable, tolerant especially in a time of war. If you consider that their own sons were off fighting in Europe and in Asia, it's quite a feat to be about to lose a loved one, potentially, and yet to receive, quote, the enemy and treat him with kindness. Michael found in the POWs a warmth toward Iowa and the people they met here. The families of POWs expressed curiosity about those times and this place. The feeling seemed so strong that in 2002, Traces set up a guided tour so the Germans could touch that history and share their stories with Americans. The work here was okay and they were treated well. At this time I came here to know where my father once lived and worked. And I hope I can understand my father a little more and maybe I, he gets more rememberings when I'm back. The tour included a stop at one of the most unusual prison camps, one of the few that still stands. It is the Wildwood Golf Course Clubhouse in Charles City. Local history buff Tracy Sweet remembers when the POWs were housed in this building. When I was six years old, my mother brought me out here. I do remember some very, I have some very vivid memories there was, a, there was barbed wire, and I do remember seeing the soldiers milling around. But some friends of mine remember that they were building houses. The prisoners were in Charles City. And her parents said, don't go over there. There's, there's German prisoners over there. So that's right away where the kids went to see them. And everybody in the town got along with them. By all, I never heard anything bad about anything that happened. They were good workers. They were clean. I heard that this floor in this room, they kept it so clean that they had to refinish it afterwards because they wore the varnish right off the floor by keeping it clean. In Algona, once the main hub of POW activity, the barracks are all gone. They were cleared away to make room for an airport. But local historians have been collecting stories from those times. When the German families visited, historians invited 94-year-old Captain Raymond Glattfelder to reminisce with them. Well, I remember uh, being stationed here from June 1944 until the prisoners of war all went home and I went home also. Approximately 17 months. Captain Glattfelder spent his days in Algona as the adjutant or manager of the camp. I'll tell you, I know the prisoners of war were treated well, they were fed well, probably better than they were at home. They were treated real good. Treatment of the prisoners by Americans is a sensitive issue. The military was determined to treat prisoners according to the Geneva Convention rules, providing them with food, clothing, medical care, and work and recreational opportunities. 
In addition, Iowa was and is widely populated by German immigrants. In the 2000 census, more than half of the state's citizens still claimed German ancestry. Back in the 1940s, many Iowans could still speak German and did their best to make their former countrymen in the POW camps feel at home. But at the same time, this friendliness was overshadowed by concerns about how American prisoners, many of them Iowans, were being treated overseas. It wasn't just out of altruistic motivations that we took such good care of the Germans. We thought, and I think it was accurate, that if the United States treated German POWs well, that that word would get back to Berlin through the Red Cross base in Switzerland, and that Hitler would treat American POWs better than otherwise would be the case. And that is actually what happened. Um, American POWs in Nazi Germany were treated much better than Soviet POWs or even British or French. Here in the Midwest, the imprisoned Germans were safe, but lonely and far from their homes and families. Many of them welcomed a chance to work in nearby factories, fields, forests, and farms. According to Michael Lewick Trams, after a short period of adjustment, Midwesterners were glad to have the help. Numerous Algonians were frightened that the POWs would escape. Uh, they'd commit crimes or attack the population. At first there was resistance to putting the base camp there. Once the people realized how much money was going to be generated by Camp Algona, that changed. Um, and after the war, the government wrote a report. And indeed, locally, millions of dollars were generated in economic activity. The men harvested a lot of crops. They saved some crops, especially pea crops up in Minnesota. Retired Senator Burl Preeb was in his late 20s when he hired some of the Algona prisoners of war for help on his farm. They were excellent carpenters, very good with stonework and carpenter. And so uh, I had some buildings up on our farm that really needed work done. So we'd go down every morning and pick up four of them. And uh, then they'd work, and we'd always feed them at noon, and there was always a guard came with them. And these people were really, uh, uh, really nice to have around. They, they didn't bother, and they worked good and all that. And the only one I can remember the name of was Fritz Kloping, and uh, he picked our little girls up and carried them around after he'd ate at noon uh, out in the, we had a nice lawn, and he'd walk around and kind of talk to them, and he said, uh, I've got a little sister in Germany the same age, but he said the town has been bombed, so he said, I really don't know whether they're alive or not. The thing that, that impressed me was the three of them, they never wanted a war. They were forced into the war because of Hitler and because of his SS troops. The prisoners were paid for their work in prison scrip, money printed just for use in camps, and they used it to buy everything from snacks and cigarettes to just about anything they could want. The International YMCA made sure that the prisoners were given access to entertainment, and with many hours on their hands, the prisoners took up expressing themselves through the arts. Together, the German families, Iowa historians, and traces have collected several thousand photos and artifacts that show how the prisoners lived and what they designed. The traces exhibit, with displays organized by Virginia Cooper of the Muscatine Art Center, has been touring the Midwest. There are journals, some complete with cartoons, drawings, and paintings. This prisoner's drawing is captioned, despite everything, humor. Some prisoners would buy paint supplies and spend time making scenes of home and family. Many a portrait, like this one of the Camp Algona chaplain, T.K. Herbener, was traded for a carton of cigarettes. Woodworking was a common hobby also, and both Nazi and American symbols found their way into the wood. In some camps, it became tough to keep the broom handles from disappearing and later reappearing as game board pieces. Then there were the performing arts. The prisoners of Camp Algona took to the stage and performed in plays that were written by their fellow thespians. Some were fantastically staged and costumed. 
Many prisoners bought musical instruments and organized groups, performing all kinds of music, from popular to classical. In Algona, a prisoner named Edward Kybe made a lasting contribution to the town. He and other prisoners paid for and carved a massive nativity scene. The scene was completed in 1945, and after the war ended, was left as a gift for Algona, where it is still open to the public every December. It's a rare major artwork, unique in that it was created by POWs of their own volition. In the final analysis. After collecting more than 75 hours of POW stories from Germans and Iowans, plus gathering 1,500 artifacts and holding numerous cultural exchanges and forums, Michael Lewick Trams says his understanding of the social costs of war has deepened. There are many lessons. For me, the most overriding lesson, the most important lesson, is that there is no such thing as an enemy. There are friends we haven't yet met. And that human beings ultimately don't really want to kill each other. They certainly don't want to be killed by one another, but they're forced into the army, they're forced um, to carry arms and to kill um, either in terms of self-defense or in, in many cases in, in, in offense. And, and those wars have such deep lasting, they, they, they leave such deep lasting scars um, and, and those wounds last for, for decades. And at the same time, Michael has learned that when people are treated with courtesy, despite the constraints of war, the effects of friendship are lasting as well. The POWs were able to form friendships here. And those Germans have never forgotten us. And they, they were allies. They became friends of us, of the United States, for the rest of their lives.